Um, I'll get this out of the way. My name is Bill Hart. I'm a professor emeritus of history here at Pilgrim College. She's uh, retired, no longer teaching. Um, and we are so happy and grateful to have with us as an honoree returning this year, Mark Levin. That is Mark with a C, not to be confused with the Mark Levin with a K, who's also a uh, director and screenwriter, right? So no, this is Mark Levin with a C. Um, and I'm just going to, you probably know many of his works. He's, he's been a writer, director, producer of many, many films, documentaries, narratives. Uh, I'll name just a few. Uh, Brick City, 2010 Peabody Award, uh, about Newark and Mayor Cory Booker. Slam, 1998, prize winner at Sundance and at Cannes, about a young black male poet and rapper in Southeast DC. The Last Party, 1999, with Robert Downey Jr. as a Bill Clinton, uh, like, I guess, the president. Uh, white Boys, in a wild film, 2000, based on young white rappers. Twilight, 2000, based on Anne Devere Smith's one woman show in LA, that's a wonderful film. And then um, last year, I promise, 2021, showing right here last year about LeBron James' efforts to close the education gap in his hometown of Akron, Ohio, which the film festival screened, as I said, last year. So, uh, and last but not least, um, Mark was a classmate of Lloyd Combs at Wesleyan University. <laughs> <laughs> And I just also learned this evening that um, Mark has a producer that he met here. I was in a panel discussion just before we had the party at the Sheldon Museum, and there was a panel discussion with documentarians who said, it's so important to show your films at film festivals, not only to get a, build an audience, but also to make connections. So last year, Mark made that kind of connection, and he hired an, a, a, a young student who's now no longer a student, but was the associate producer on this film. You should introduce him, Mark. Daniel Levesque, right here. Homegrown <laughs> talent. I'm just going to ask a couple of questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. We've got a good uh, 20, 20, 25, 20 to 25 minutes before we have to march up to the Sheldon for party number two tonight. Um, but as a historian, I was really struck by the epigraph that opens the film by uh, Tom Payne, saying that from 1797, poverty is not foreordained. And as one of your spokesperson said, it is a government policy choice. So it can be a government policy choice to eliminate a poverty through things like guaranteed income. Um, and I was I'm doing a little bit of reading about it. I want to thank my friend Sylvia for pointing this out to me, that uh, this has been practiced by many, many countries around the globe for many, many years. It's been practiced off and on in the, since the 1960s in some American cities. Alaska has been giving residents there a guaranteed income from the oil uh, revenue since 1982. And now there are 100 cities in the US who practice this. Sounds like a lot, over 100 cities. In the grand scheme of things, it's not that many cities, but it's, it's a significant amount. And we were talking earlier that a film here at the festival showed this afternoon on guaranteed income in Gary, Indiana. So I'd like to ask you, Mark, um, why now? I mean, what, what compelled you to, to tell this important story now? And why, why should others be familiar and aware of this story? Well, I think there's two, two parts that first COVID changed everything as, as the mayor Carter said uh, and all of a sudden the idea you know people out of work people unable to pay their rent to get food uh, and checks uh, during the Trump administration went out to individuals and families all over the country and all of a sudden a radical shift from Ronald Reagan's theory of you know the seven most scary words are on from the government and I'm here to help you to wow, I got a check, I can make it, I can survive this lockdown, this, this unknown that we're facing. I think that radically changed uh, many, many people's perspective. The second part is I did a film with Michael Tubbs in Stockton. I had heard about this initial municipal um, effort in Stockton, California. He was the youngest mayor. He was elected when he was 26 years old, the youngest uh, elected mayor of a major U.S. city. 
the first African American mayor of Stockton. And so I went out there and was intrigued by what he was doing and this uh, first pilot uh, was part of the reason. So we became friends and he lost re-election, <coughs> partially due to uh, his opponent campaign saying tax money was being given to poor people. And the people in Stockton didn't like that, but of course that wasn't even true because at that point it was a totally philanthropic effort. The money was from uh, wealthy individuals, uh, many out of Silicon Valley. Um, but he moved to LA with his wife uh, and he started this Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. And I started meeting some of the people. COVID had happened and all of a sudden um, this thing started kind of gaining traction and I thought this is a fascinating way of kind of looking at how our economy, you know, impacts real people, everyday people. I've done a series of films since the 2008 Great Recession that really did focus on how everyday people were being impacted by these global economic forces. Uh, so this kind of was a continuation of that. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the trick was wanted to make it, you know, let the, the, the participants tell the story, but how to kind of create um, a film that wasn't just a survey, you know, how do you feel today, you know, uh, where you get to know the people enough, you get to see that, look, uh, as much as this is, uh, uh, the, the tagline we use is uh, a, a little money can make uh, a world of difference. Still, we're facing all the other challenges you know, that, that people face every day, whether it's health, whether it's uh, the school racism, you know, all the different problems. Um, so that was kind of uh, where we started, and but how to balance, you know, we wanted to go to more cities, but how many cities can you take? How many people can you absorb? You know, their stories, it, it was tricky. Uh, so that, that was really the challenge of the film, to, to allow the participants to tell the story, but to give, to not spread it so wide that you lose contact with them and the struggles that they're making. Um, yeah, and that's how we got here. And the idea, I guess the final thing is that, as you just said, 100 cities is, is a lot, but it's not that many in terms of how many cities there are in this country. And um, you look at the national news, like we'll look at, few minutes from now, Trump in Atlanta, you know, just the, the dysfunction in Washington, the craziness. You don't even know this stuff is happening. You know, it's like subterranean. Uh, but on a local level, uh, just as like a film festival that you were referring to, on this local level, it's fascinating that many communities are experimenting. In fact, I, uh, Lloyd's wife sent me a, a piece today that in Burlington, uh, I didn't know about this, there's actually a program, very small pilot, but for at-risk homeless youth. I think only, you know, 30 uh, kids, but $1,500 a month, which is certainly generous, for 18 months uh, out of Burlington, a uh, pilot program. Um, so on the local level, it's, uh, you can get so dispirited watching the national news and the freak show, you know, which is certainly at full tilt tonight, uh, and you lose sight that, hey, in a lot of places, people are actually doing good work, and they're actually innovative ideas, and people's lives are being impacted. And I like the fact that you are tell you have been, and, and in this film you do, tell stories of people, uh, of ordinary people from ordinary walks of life. However, I was really struck by the range of subjects you got here. Um, range in terms of class, ethnicity, gender, uh, profession, learning this. I mean, you have a Harvard professor who is collecting guaranteed income. You've got a school bus driver. You've got people who are nurses' assistants, etc. And yet, they all seem so eager and honest to tell their stories. And, and I'm just wondering about that challenge because I believe that documentary filmmakers, like good anthropologists, have to gain the trust of their subjects in order to tell the story. So were there major challenges to that? How did you go about doing that? Well, two things. First, uh, in many of those cities, uh, they, the um, 
people that set the programs up had what they called a storytelling cadre, a small group of people that volunteered to make themselves available uh, to talk to the press, to, you know, mostly local news or the local newspaper, but they were willing because many people, of course, were, you know, I don't want anyone to know, I'm getting government help, or <laughs> another one which surprised me, I don't want anyone to know because all my friends are going to call me and ask me uh, if I can, I can borrow some money. Uh, and so yeah, they're they're you know, and even the self-selected, you know, people that we met, um, you know, they were like, oh yeah, great for five minutes on the local news or on a radio show, but you know, we were saying, well, we're looking for a little more in depth, you know, where maybe you know we'll come back once or twice or maybe even more. Uh, so there was hesitancy, definitely. I mean, even you know when. Um, Abby and Anders move in with their parents. You know, obviously they were like, you know, we're embarrassed. Uh, so I actually had to tell them, I said, hey, you shouldn't be embarrassed. I said, I'm going to tell you the truth. My daughter and her husband just moved in with my wife and I, and they're, two, and they're twins. Uh, and uh, I said, look, this is, this is where we're at. And, and my daughter works at the Met, the best museum in the world, and, and, and her husband is a professor at Bard. Uh, and they had twins, uh, and they had an apartment in Harlem. But to pay a uh, you know a nanny for twins, thousand dollars in cash a week, you know it's fifty thousand dollars right there. And uh, my wife and I, we got a loft and said, hey, look, you know, you want to save some money, try to make it. So when Abby and Anders heard that, they were like, all right, well, I guess we'll let it come on. <laughs> Oh, it's funny, I worked at both of those institutions uh, back in the 70s and 80s, so small world. Uh, before I turn it over to the audience, you took how many months or years to shoot this film? It was shot over a year. You know, we wanted, as you saw, you know, we wanted to release, uh, St. Paul was one of the first cities up, and, and Melvin Carter, the mayor of St. Paul, was one of the first, as you see with uh, Tubbs, you know, the one of the first to really come on board and say, you know, uh, we're going to make this happen. Um, so we wanted to follow at least a few from the beginning to when they lose it, because that was always a big question. Okay, this is a great idea, but it only lasts a year, so is it really going to make an impact? Uh, so, you know, we thought that was important to give it at least a year that we could do that. Think you do a follow-up with them, some of them? Uh, I, you know, it's being discussed. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, let's turn now over to the audience and see if you have any questions. Um, I hope the room is small enough so you don't need a mic, but I'm happy to come down if you do. If you can't hear, I'll either repeat the question or give you the mic. Yes? Mark, what, was there a singular way that these cities were providing the income? Were they, were they through the phone, uh, through a bank account, through some kind of card based? It was Could you hear the question in the back? How, how, money, how, the, how the cities got the money into the hands of the recipients? Yeah, one way they did it or you know, Yeah, it was mostly with a card. Just a card. Yeah, it was mostly with a card. Yeah. But each city did it a little differently, had a different kind of nonprofit, um, you know, kind of managing it. Um, and obviously each city had a different protocol, as you saw in, you know, in, um, in Gainesville. They went for people coming out of prison, uh, which certainly was controversial. Um, some other communities, it was a single parent, you know, parent of, uh, of children, that, but is the sole caregiver. So, you know, uh, as in Burlington now, just at-risk homeless youth. You know, so each city designed it a little differently. And uh, Cambridge, as you see in the film, it kind of goes by, but Cambridge is the first city that made it not a pilot. They've turned it into actual municipal policy. That if, as, as the mayor said, if you're below the federal poverty level, you qualify. So the, the, the people you saw, the Harvard, ex former Harvard professor, and Portia and her daughter, they're actually eligible for another year now. Uh, it's, and it's no longer a pilot. It's actually a, a, a municipal policy in, in the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yes, question in the back. Yeah, um, and, and going to all the cities and speaking with everyone, did you find any city that was effectively um, 
uh, responding or being proactive through their storytelling against the kind of Fox News, oh yeah, well, who wouldn't want it? free money? The whole attack that we, you know, Bernie got. Um, you know, if we were to take this nationally again, because the inequality has become so much more extreme, it's a great moment to move this, but automatically you're playing into that long-term, 50-year, oh, they just want free money, it's just they're lazy, blah, blah, blah. So did you see any city that was effectively um, in almost plain offense to put these stories out uh, in a way? I mean, your movie well, does. Your movie does. Well, that's the idea of the movie. Yeah. Uh, and, and the movie is going to go on tour this year, you know, into the presidential campaign. Because the child tax credit, take that for example. Yeah. I mean, that, that, it's just insane that it couldn't be, you know, extended or made right. permanent. Unfortunately, two Democrats, you know, the fact they mentioned and cinema. Uh, otherwise, it, it, it could have. But the entire Republican Party, you know, voted against it. Uh, I mean, they had all the data that it had reduced child poverty by, you know, between 40 and 50 percent. I mean, it, it, it's just mindless. Uh, in every other advanced industrial nation, Canada, in Europe, you know, families get help, you know, to, to, for child care, for daycare, uh, and here in the United States, you know, so that I know is going to be an issue coming up in this cycle. Uh, and so, um, Michael Tubbs, who you know you see in the film, uh, has has raised money for a national tour of the discussion of really the state of the economy, <coughs> income inequality, insecurity, where we're at, guaranteed income, uh, and this film will be part of that tour. It's going to go to uh, Orlando uh, in a few weeks, and it's going to go to Boston, to Cambridge. Uh, but it's going to go to many of these cities with, like what we're having right here, a discussion uh, and other academics and others, you know, involved in panels uh, to try and take this national. That's Tubbs's initiative. And California is probably leading, although, as I said, Cambridge, Massachusetts is really the first that has basically said, this is no longer a pilot, this is where our city is at. Uh, Mayor Siddiqui, and she's going to be hosting a screening on the 28th uh, in in Cambridge, probably at Harvard. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just, but again, you know, if you saw in the debate last night or, uh, uh, you know, the lunacy that's going on right now, uh, you know, it's just hard to, to, to kind of get through. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and even, you know, I, I've been very lucky in my career, you know, to work with all the major you know, cable and, and streamers and everything. Uh, but it's interesting when they see a film like this, it's like, I love the film, but it's an issue film. We're not really dealing with issue films anymore. <laughs> now, if somebody in there committed a crime, you know, that, you know, well, then we'd have a hook, you know. Uh, but um, so, you know, that that's the challenge. Uh, I give Tubbs a lot of credit. He and I have obviously become friends. And, uh, uh, but that's the idea, is this film was made not so much to immediately get it on TV or streamer, but literally to try to use it as part of this tour and, and as part of stimulating what we know is a critical dialogue on, you know, how do we rethink our economy? Yeah. I mean, to hear Lyndon Johnson say in 1964, you know, uh, the rich have got to help the poor. And we all have to do something, right. be part of that. I mean, we've left that so far behind. Yeah. Uh, and how to re-engage and, uh, and, and, and kind of restart the discussion. So look, it's a huge challenge. Uh, Bernie, obviously, you know, uh, some years ago was in the middle of that and got a lot of Americans excited, uh, the Wall Street, you know, the, the Occupy Wall Street movement. But it's just been eclipsed by all the lunacy that we're dealing with, and I guess you know the direct threat to you know American democracy and uh, everything else. That this most fundamental question of how do we in the 21st century kind of rethink the way the economy should work for the society as a whole? The irony is, you know, the wealthiest of the wealthy they live in gated communities, they live with security guards. I mean. They, they, it, 
it makes no sense. A more equal society, a less insecure society is better for everyone, but when people are afraid, as Martin Luther King's daughter says, and when fear is the animating emotion, it is easier to manipulate people. Uh, that, is, that is the bottom line. Uh, and so in that sense, there is, there, there are certain powerful forces that feel, hey, why not? You know, as you said, why, why, we need poverty. You know, yeah. we need poverty to keep everyone, you know, a little on edge. That they could, if not for the grace of God, you could be there too. Built into the system. Poverty is built into the system, yes. We have other questions? In the back, way in the back. Yes. Yeah, I was just curious on your like filmmaking process and how do you go about directing like these really personal stories that are told by these subjects? How do you go about directing that for realism, um, like while you're inside their house and all that with their kids and everything? Well, I think that goes uh, to what Bill was saying in the beginning. You, you do have to develop trust. I mean, that is the bottom line. You know, you have to open yourself uh, just as they're opening themselves. You also have to be, I mean, I often think of, uh, it's a little like jazz in that, you know, you have a plan, you, you've got a story in mind, you've got certain beats that you want to kind of hit to be able to tell at the beginning, middle, and end in the story. Um, but at the same time, you've got to be open to accidents or reading the moment now, and, I, and, the, and the climactic scene in the film. Uh, Lucille told us, you know, that she wanted to adopt these two young uh, kids, and uh, so obviously we knew about it. And then she said, uh, the morning we were shooting, um, I'm gonna, you know, call and see if I can get permission, you know, because I said, do you think they'll allow us in a civil court? You know, we need to give the court the heads up. We can't just walk in with a camera crew. And she said, so I'm, I'm gonna call them today. So that was at the bus depot. <laughs> Uh, and she was calling her, but all of a sudden it turned into, because, uh, you know, there was still concerns about COVID and everything, even though it was past the, you know, the lockdown, uh, the whole process started on her cell phone. Uh, and she just sat down with the two babies, and thank goodness Alan, my, my DP, uh, he held that shot, which, you know, normally I would be, Okay, we got that shot. Now let's get a profile shot. Let's get some close-ups of each of the kids. You know, uh, but he just held that three shot, uh, which was incredible. I mean, because none of us knew exactly what was happening. You know, as a, you know, once you heard your honor, then we, oh wow, is this, is this actually the the adoption process? And there it was unfolding. Um, so anyway, I, I, you know, to answer your question, I think trust. You have to have a plan. You know, to you know what you're what you're going for, what you're looking for, even though it's a it's a follow God. But you've got to be open to the moments just appearing. Uh, I think those are the keys. And that is a very powerful shot. That three shot, very powerful. I saw one hand over here on the right. Now, we have time just for one more question. I'm interested to know why you didn't pick up on the theme from raising the floor. Well, um, this is, you know, the, the idea of raising the floor, at least my understanding of it, is, okay, every family would have enough so they could have a place to sleep at night, have clothes that they can wear, and have food that they can eat. You know, that, that that is the aspiration of a society that has eliminated poverty in its most basic form. And this is a step. Now, you know, it's not an answer to everything. It's to open people's minds to, one, that the government can actually be a constructive force, not a destructive force, where we pretty much live with Reagan's mantra for the last 40 years uh, that government get out of the way, let the free market do its thing. 
And two, it's a beginning of reconceiving, you know, where, okay, the New Deal happened in the 30s, the Great Society in the 60s, we've kind of, in this, you know, since Reagan came in, moved away from that. It's been a, a movement, uh, even amongst Democrats, Clinton, you know, we were ending welfare as we know it. So it's time for a new formula, a new common, you know, contract, social contract. And this is a, a way to begin to think about what would that look like. Um, so that, you know, yes, we have to raise the floor, you know, to $500 isn't giving everybody a home, as, as the young woman from Los Angeles said. You know, even $1,000 isn't going to get you it's just a studio, you know, let, let alone food. The point that I was talking about was that book was based on a year spent by a man, a, a union leader, traveling around the country, talking to all kinds of people. And what he found out was that there will not be enough work, and that there won't be jobs. And so this will not be merely, uh, not merely, this will not be only the question of the existing poverty, but a question of the future, where our society will not be providing jobs. Well, that, you know, when you asked about sequel, uh, that, uh, that is very much, you're right, the, especially, I mean, as I said, the original pilot that was done in Stockton was financed by Silicon Valley, people out of Silicon Valley, who basically had that feeling that given where technology is going, given where AI is going, is that we're not going to have a society where people work five days a week, nine to five, you know, and we're not going to have that work. And so what are we going to do? So that is certainly a, a legitimate question and something that I'm in discussions on right now. Thank you, Mark, for bringing your beautiful thing.